the movement of people coming or going. Um, I'm very excited today. We have Mary Tiger here to talk about water and utility um, sewer needs. Excuse me, water and sewer utility needs. Um, any of you who know me well know that I have a strong passion for the water and sewer industry. In fact, my coworkers knew it so much that they came into my office and all told me to set this up. The good news is Mary's here and easily available for all of us. She is the Chief Operating Officer of the Environment Finance Center and her technical work, Mary conducts applied research with local communities on research, resource and financial sustainability. She was the project manager for and for and primary author of the recently published Water Research Foundation report titled, Defining a Resilient Business Model for Water Utilities. Mary holds an MPA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a BS in Environmental Journalism from the University of North Carolina at Asheville. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary to get going with the presentation. Hey, thank you, Karen. So I saw the title of my presentation was Water and Sewer Utility Needs, which is a huge topic. So narrowing that down to revenue resilience in a changing industry, um, which is very important to meet the growing needs of water um, and sewer utilities. So just to get a feel of who all is in the room, how many of you all are involved in setting the budget for your water utility, water sewer utility? What are some of the trends that you're seeing going on with revenue at your utility? Declining consumption. Declining consumption. Anybody else declining consumption? Yeah, that's one, one of the biggest challenges. And I'll get, oh. I was just gonna say we've had flat consumption. It hasn't declined, but it hasn't increased. Right. Yeah. And increased reliance on these base charges instead of volumetric charges. Oh, your utility is going towards base charges? What utility? Okay. Yeah. We're side that. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> right. One of a kind utility in the state. Um, anybody else? How about the recession? Anybody? Did that impact anybody's utility revenues? Something going on? So what the report that I'm going to talk about was a um, water research foundation report called "Defining a Resilient Business Model um, for Water Utilities." So it's funded by the Water Research Foundation and EPA, and we work with Raptalis. Um, so that's that's the foundation of what I'm going to talk about. But the trends that you guys um, are seeing, you're not alone. This is us um, with the Environmental Finance Center. You guys are you know, undoubtedly familiar with the School of Government. Uh, we're a applied research center within the School of Government that's financed by um, outside grants and contracts. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary group, so we, uh, we have engineers on staff, we have public administrators on staff, we have um, folks that have masters of environmental management, so we're pulling together a lot of um, disciplines and approaching these topics that you guys are dealing with. We don't have any attorneys, so we're unique in the School of Government from that perspective. Um, we also work outside of North Carolina. So this project that I'm gonna talk about was a national, nationally focused project. That's another thing that sets us apart a little bit different. Our mission is that we are dedicated to enhancing the ability of governments and other organizations to provide environmental programs and services in fair, effective, and financially sustainable way. The shorthand that we say of what we do is that we help people figure out how to pay for environmental projects. So I work a lot with water and wastewater utilities. We have folks on staff that work with a lot in the energy world, clean energy finance projects. We do solid waste um, finance, wetland protection, stormwater management, those types of um, financial projects. And we do applied research, teaching and outreach, program design and evaluation. A little plug, there's a sign up sheet um, on your table to sign up for our blog. We, in our applied research, we're constantly putting out information about what we're doing. Um, so that's on your table, and Karen told me to tell you guys that that's, how, that, that's one of our performance metrics. <laughs> um, and it's part of our funding, so I thought you guys would appreciate um, that we are, are very interested in getting information out there and getting more blog subscribers. So to jump in um, re into revenue resiliency for, for water utilities, the report that, that we wrote really um, had three major chapters. One is that we focus on trends in revenue and pricing in the water utility industry. 
North Carolina is heavily um, focused on, and so it's prominent in the report because we have great um, data from the LGC in our annual rate survey. So North Carolina was really one of the states that we focused on, but we also have data from Georgia, Ohio, Wisconsin, and California. And so we're kind of putting the revenue and financial trends in a national context to do some comparisons. We also look at the factors influence revenue, revenue resilience, consumption, economic recession, and kind of isolated those and looked at them and their impact on utilities um, revenue. And then we closed out with strategies and practices for revenue resilience. And that's when I'm gonna, I'll talk to you a little bit through that report. Um, this is one of the many um, charts that's in the report um, that we looked at the annual increases in total operating revenues between years. So how much were utility revenues going up or going down in between years? And we did that for the same 500 utilities across the country. Now these were, this is from Moody's Water and Sewer Municipal um, Database. So it's only the utilities that Moody's rates. Um, so you can think about how that might influence the data a little bit. But what, the reason why I brought this in front of you is that it's pretty bumpy. Um, get to zero over here, you don't see, this is the 75th uh, percentile. So most utilities are in the positive, have been in the positive since 2004. So year to year, their revenues are going up, but perhaps not as much as they were hoping. There are some that, that were dipping. And so through this report, we looked at why. What were the reasons why they were going up and going down? And we isolated a, um, a few um, factors that were really playing a difference. One is service area size and diversity. Um, so the bigger that you are, um, the better buffer that you have in some cases. Uh, water use and weather, economic conditions, those are the two major ones. And I'll get into um, why they're kind of creating this perfect storm for water utilities. Capacity utilization, economic regulation and governance. So in Wisconsin, Every utility there has to go to the state, um, take their rate case to the state in addition to a governing board. Um, what that does <laughs> for the rate increases, the rate increase requests, they're a lot less frequent um, and they're bigger when they do that. Um, so we looked at that, we teased that apart. Financial management strategies, so internally things that you can do, how that influences revenue. And then the role of credit rating agencies um, in that revenue. We identified four major challenges right now to the utility business model. So there, there's a term, I think, people love this term, the new normal. You guys are probably hearing it everywhere. So that's, um, this is the new normal for water utility revenues. First is that there's a paradoxical relationship between revenue stability and conservation promotion. Before I um, started at the MPA program, I ran a conservation program for a small water and power utility in Colorado. And I was so excited, I wanted everybody to conserve water and, and energy, and I would bang my head against the wall of the finance director's office because he was like, Mary, we don't want you to do a good job. We want you to fail because if people use less of our product, we have less revenues and, um, and we need those. So there's this kind of conflict, but water utilities want people to use less of their water. Um, we, look, okay. um, we are looking at trends in, with North Carolina utilities, utilities across the country, and looking at this, are, the, are rates getting more fixed or more variable? In North Carolina, they're getting, they've gotten more variable from 2007 to 2011. We looked at that shift in the base versus variable um, charge that people are sending customers. So, these are the utilities who have increased the fixed portion of the bill. These are the utilities that have decreased the fixed portion of the bill. So there are more, and these folks are doing it to a greater extent. So they're increasing the consumption charges um, and maybe not um, fixing or working on the fixed charges. So there's fewer, like Winston-Salem, that are actually increasing the base charges. So just, why is that? Why, are, why would utilities be increasing um, consumption charges over base charges? Sort of a fairness issue in a way. I mean, you have a set population. 
population that, you know, we're in White County, we've experienced a lot of growth, but you've got folks that have lived in our community forever, and they're on fixed income. So if you increase that base, in essence, there is some thought that you punish those people, and you should really be charging the folks that are using it. So it's sort of a how, what we talked about yesterday, what do you value? What else are our utilities kind of probably thinking when they're putting more cost recovery into the variable charges? If your goal is to discourage consumption, you would put more of the cost on consumption. Right, right. And those are kind of the two reasons that we're seeing this kind of trend towards um, increased variable charges. Um, and not only are utilities kind of doing that, but also in North Carolina we've seen over the past seven years, kind of a movement away from decreasing block charges, where the um, variable rate decreases the more you use, and a trend towards increasing block. So moving more cost recovery, particularly into those higher levels of consumption. Which is great when people actually use it, but when you send that message, when you send that signal, and people use less, um, this is what the customers so this is a cartoon. We love this one um, because it, it does, it kind of illustrates what um, customers feel when you increase the consumption charges, you tell them use less water, use less water, they do, and then the utility has to come up and increase rates, particularly this was um, during, you know, on the heels of a drought. So they did what the utility asked them to, they used less water, um, and um, they were punished by the big fat cat utility um, by increasing rates on the back end. This is, they did not look this way, I apologize for that. Um, I did not look that way on my computer. This is happening, as you guys know, because water utility revenue variability does not match um, the revenue variability. So customers use less, but the costs don't go down. Um, these are two examples from Alameda County Water District, California, and Austin, Texas. We have examples from utilities across the country where we looked at variable costs, really broke down what, what are the variable costs. Um, it's usually, at most, about 20% of utilities' expenses really go down when water use goes down. And that's probably being fairly generous in that category. So 80% of costs year to year are fixed for the utility. And it's pretty much the inverse for revenues. Most utilities are recovering about 80% of their revenues from that variable charge and 20% from the fixed. That would be challenging for any industry under the best of circumstances. Um, but the water industry across, across the country is not dealing with the best of circumstances. Um, the American um, Society of Civil Engineers gave the water and sewer industry a grade of D um, for the infrastructure. So passing, but barely. I wouldn't be happy. Um, the new bar students would be. Um, EPA and AWWA agree that there's a lot. There's a large and looming um, crisis with the um, infrastructure in this country. They, are you guys familiar with the term the Nessie, the Nessie curve? Which shows kind of, it's the Nessie, if you think about the Loch Ness Monster coming out of the water, and that kind of exponential growth of the Nessie, of the Nessie's, the monster's neck. That's kind of what the infrastructure needs of this country looks like. It's kind of cr cruising along, and then it's this in exponential growth in need. So that's what the utilities are going to have to be dealing with, increasing rates even more. And so as you have this variability, increasing rates, driving down consumption, you can see how it could get into a bit of a downward spiral um, for the water industry. Tag on that, um, weather and customer demand uncertainty. Um, these are trends from Owasa. Ed Kerwin um, shared with us this data. So this is Owasa from 1986 to 2002. Their um, water sales <coughs> cruising right along um, with customer accounts. At 2002, they were projecting increased water sales. Why wouldn't they? 
Um, that's, that's what they thought they were going to be dealing with. But that's what, ha that's what has happened since 2002 with water sales. Was there a mass exodus out of Chapel Hill? <laughs> no, that's the customer accounts continued to increase. Um, so this is what Owasa was dealing with. What happened? 2002-2003 drought hit and knocked people, um, people's consumption totally down. They had to. The utility had to ask people to use less of their product. Um, after 2002-2003, it kind of creeps up. Yeah, creeps up there. Um, and then the 2007-2008 drought hit it again. Owasa at this point um, enacted restrictions like many utilities across the state. They also um, applied a drought surcharge, a pretty punitive drought surcharge. At the highest levels, they have an increasing block rate structure, and at the highest levels, it got up to 50, a little over $50 per thousand gallons. So that's what people in the highest levels of consumption were paying per thousand gallons. And people got that signal. They didn't like to be restricted, as any of the customers, they didn't want to be restricted, and then they got a financial signal. Um, and they got such a financial signal that they made significant changes. So you kind of hit people with that, and they don't just change their behavior, but they actually invest in personal infrastructure that's going to take their water use down forever. So they'll either totally re-landscape their yard, they'll get a new irrigation system, they'll do something to not um, have to pay that. So we call that the drought hangover. So you can see that coming out of the 2007-2008 drought. One of their customers that got the biggest signal, um, more so with not wanting to be restricted, was UNC. And UNC decided, we're going to start using reclaimed water on all of our fields. And they, we're going to invest in that infrastructure. We're going to do it. It's exciting. OWASP is very excited about it. But you can see what it has done to their water sales. So managing. Your revenue in that kind of situation, when you're, you know, really relying on variable revenue, it's it's really challenging. Um, you guys heard it. Um, this is what's happening across the country: is that it's not just in times of drought that people are using less water. People are just using less water across the board. The energy um, industry is not dealing with this <coughs> because there's always new like iPhones, iPads new reasons to use power. They're not dealing with this kind of um, decline in use. They're seeing some efficiency, they're promoting some efficiency, but we're not coming up with new way, new things to do with water. We're actually finding ways to do what we currently do with water with less water. Um, and that's what a report found that was released in 2011. They did a study in um, Louisville, Kentucky, and they found that a household in 2008 used about 12,000 gallons less annually than an identical household did in 1978. So 1,000 gallons less a month for every single household. And we're seeing that in North Carolina. We used to say 5,000 gallons per month is the benchmark. That's the average household water use in North Carolina. That's what we used for our dashboards that I'll bring back up. We use that in a lot of our reports. Now it's looking more like 4,000. That's kind of the benchmark to use is 4,000 gallons per month is what the average North Carolinian uses in water. And the reason um, gosh, is um, controlling for weather, controlling for people in the household. So um, people in households is usually going down, so that would contribute to a decline in water use. Um, education, as education goes up, um, that usually accounts for a little bit of decline in water use. Um, average home value, as home value goes up, water use goes up. Home size, as that goes up, water use goes up. So all of those have little tiny impact on um, customer household water use. The biggest one is increased installation of low flow appliances. This is not because of a rebate program that the water utility has. This is mostly attributable to the 1992 Energy Policy Act that changed the hardware that was sold um, in houses. And that with high efficiency toilets, you can't buy a 3.5 gallon um, toilet anymore. It's 1.6. You can get a 1.28. You can get a 1.1, I think, even now. But you can't go below 
um, 1.6 at all. So as the infrastructure gets replaced, um, water use is continuing to, to go down. We got a group of um, water utility CEOs from across the country and just asked them, what is this, you know, we, we didn't say declining um, water use, we didn't, we just said, what, what are changes in water use doing to your revenues? Overwhelmingly, they said, a large, we're having a large negative impact um, on our Um, the key findings from the report is that um, the past five years have really been trying for the water industry. So they've seen it's you know kind of a perfect storm of the economic recession combined with the water use infrastructure getting completely changed out. Water use is on the decline. And then in order to raise sufficient and predictable revenues in the future, water utilities really have to kind of start rethinking their business model. And that's what I love about being at the EFC is that I work for a consultant. We don't have to do what, you know, what is politically feasible in the near term. We can kind of play with some ideas and push the envelope a little bit. Um, and we identified strategies and practices for revenue resilience. Some of these are completely politically feasible and great ideas to go ahead and start doing now. Um, some of the ones, the one I'm gonna end up talking about, the alternative rate designs, we're seeing that as a very kind of nascent idea. It's a fun thing to talk about right now at conferences. Um, and I'll give you guys some, some insight into the models that we're talking about. But the, the strategies that we identified were demand projections. So just starting to get realistic with, um, with what you're projecting for water use. Really kind of looking at the trends nationally um, as well as locally. I think we have a, a blog post that says water rates don't break budgets, bad projections do. Just getting a lot smarter with the projections, I know you guys have been talking about you know, using data and really looking at customer changes in household water use, not just on the aggregate, but looking at those trends and tracking individual household trends over time. Um, the alternative rate designs, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Rate stabilization reserves, so rainy day funds. Again, that can be politically challenging, but we're seeing a lot of water utilities set aside um, reserves just to cover the droughts and the really kind of disruptive things when your projections aren't entirely um, right. There have become expectations with those from governing boards, credit rating agencies, um, that make those a little bit more um, challenging. Rethinking utility services. So there are utilities that are offering service line um, protection, so behind the meter, actually insuring those lines and offering that service for additional money as, as a way to get additional revenue into the utility. Um, leasing you know, cell phone towers uh, or leasing water towers for cell phone um, towers is, um, that one has been around for a while, but there are, there are utilities that are thinking about different ways to package what they offer um, to have new business lines come in. Setting financial performance targets and really tracking and managing for those. Um, providing customer assistance and affordability programs and not trying to have your rate design do everything. Um, it's promote conservation, address affordability, equity, and recover the revenue that you need in a stable and a predictable fashion. Not asking that much of your rate structure, but instead um, leaning more on customer assistance and affordability programs to provide the outlet for the folks that need it. And rate adjustment approaches, so using um, CPI to um, at least annually have a CPI um, adjustment to your rate structures or multi-year rate increases. So going before the board once and saying here's what we need for five years um, are some things that we're seeing for utilities to move towards. Um, revenue reserve. So I'll spend the last bit of time. Any kind of questions or comments about that? Well, I have one comment too. In addition to the droughts that everyone's well aware of, we had, even years without droughts, several really hot summers over that period of time. And so I think what we've seen is a shift in people's landscaping decisions because of, you know, if it's 95 instead of 85, <coughs> it takes a lot more water to keep that plant alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, and the 
then you have a rainy summer. So a couple of summers ago it was very rainy, and that's just as detrimental. Um, so it's that kind of peaky behavior um, that is that is really what water utilities should be targeting for the use. It's not the the big household that has you know eight people living in it and consistently using a lot of water, um, but it's the people that are on again, off again. Um, they want their water when they want it now. You have to build your capacity to meet that demand, but then it rains and they don't need it. Um, and then they're not, with that over-reliance on the variable charge, then the utility's not able to really recover that 80% of their costs that are fixed in the short term. That, that was a good segue into these alternative rate models. And that's kind of the, um, idea that we had in setting up some of these models is how can pricing better target that peaky behavior and not just the big um, consumer. So we have one called the peak set base model that was really inspired by demand ratchet rates for <coughs> energy utilities. The energy utilities for large commercial and industrial customers have demand charges. So when whatever moment a large customer is using their most, there is a charge applied to that amount, and then that holds true for the next year. So you have, you're making a payment based on your peak consumption. Um, that's what, that's the inspiration for the peak set base model. There's actually a utility, um, it's kind of a sad case study to bring up now, but I think we can all learn from what they um, went through. In Davis, um, California, they have a consumption-based fixed, or they propose a consumption-based fixed revenue water rate um, that was based on customer's peak. That actually failed the number of, it, it made it through Proposition 218, which in California, if water utilities want to increase rates, they have to take it to a referendum to the people. Um, it passed 218, but then it got challenged um, in court, so it just recently got shot down. Um, the customer select model, I'm not supposed to say this because people apparently don't like their cell phone plans, but it's inspired by the cell phone plan. And I'll get into um, a little bit more of the structure of that. And then a water-wise dividend model, which was inspired by REI. So turning some of that revenue around um, at the end of the year, as long as you meet financial targets, turning it around to customers and giving it to those that were water-wise. It's not completely unprecedented DC water last year um, cut a check to all of their big users. So they did it inverse of what we would like for them to do. Um, instead of cutting a check to those people that were um, stewards of the water, they turned it around and gave it to the people that were the biggest um, So we have a video. I came in here and realized there's no um, speakers. So I can't show for you the video. We do have a, a whiteboard video um, that we developed that kind of in ten, less than 10 minutes, kind of talks about these challenges to the um, water utility business model and discusses these rate structures a little bit. Um, we developed them for water utilities to use um, in having this conversation with their governing boards about um, revenue resiliency, revenue variability. So I do encourage you guys to, to locate that and look at that. Um, I'm not gonna play it for you now, but I'll bring you, there's a few snapshots. Um, here, and I'll use those to explain each one of these models. So this is the peak set base model. Again, it's looking at, it's using, um, building more cost recovery into the fixed charge, less into the variable, but doing it in a way that still promotes wise water use, um, still taking into account a customer's consumption. So under the peak set base model, um, you would look at a customer's historical demand, look at their month of highest consumption. So for this lady, it's right there in the middle of the summer. Um, she's using the most water to water her lawn. So you snapshot that monthly consumption and you apply a rate to that consumption at, or to set the fixed charge for next year. Um, actually in a way to kind of mitigate against drought years, rainy years, you would actually take the, you would average, the three year rolling average is how we're modeling um, of the peak. So you take the past three peak years of consumption, average that, use that to set the fixed charge. There's 
question. If you had an AMR or an AMI system, wouldn't it be more effective to utilize that as opposed to a monthly fee? Because a lot of the plant capacity is built into, just like you would be on electric capacity, is built into daily fees, not into monthly fees or averages. Yes. So wouldn't it be much more effective to use an AMI or an AMR system? It would be. To determine that. We have modeled these to be under kind of the largest use of um, metering technology right now. Um, I wouldn't recommend getting into the 15 minute increment, which is what energy utilities do, but the daily, um, daily demand, you could look at your daily peak and use that to set a fixed charge. Um, and then you could, you also could do coincident peak. So if there was a way to send a signal to your customers, we're gonna, our plant is gonna be peaking today. I mean, there's so much that you can do with technology. A lot of these ideas are kind of founded on the existing popular, or you know, what's in the ground right now. But we are looking at modeling um, these rate structures with new technology. And actually, we're um, we're modeling these rate structures for um, Cary right now, Owasa, Charlotte, um, and Fayetteville Public Works, and. We did preliminary analysis of all three of the models for them and then asked them to choose which one they wanted a deeper dive in. And I'll give you the answer of what they're looking at a deeper dive in. But the technology that Kiri has in their ground right now is a whole, um, opens the door for a lot more um, kind of tailored rate structures. And that's what all of these are, kind of individualized rate structures. Um, getting away from the broth, <coughs> broadly applied rate structures. Is the peak set base generally uh, based off of the account holder or that address? So let's say I, move, I sell my house, someone moves in, is it based on my three years of use before they moved in or just them as an account holder? So there are a couple ways to deal with that. Um, what we are thinking about in modeling these, again, no, nobody's applied it, but to do a kind of, um, settling up at the end. So to give people, here's the best guess of what your peak is gonna be, um, and then doing some sort of settling up at the end of the first year. Um, but it would be, it is at the household level. We have model, we've looked at doing these for, um, me at the meter level, but we find it makes the most sense to model them at the premise level. So combining the irrigation meter with the standard meter, um, is really going to target that kind of peaky outdoor behavior and kind of combine that consumption. So these still have a, so the, the <coughs> challenge with this kind of model is this delayed react, delayed pricing signal. How are people going to respond? We don't, we don't really know. <laughs> We're really interested in kind of talking to people about how they understand these rates, how, what they think their reaction would be. Um, but we do know that it is gonna be a delayed pricing signal. The decisions that you make this month are gonna impact your rate for three years to come. Um, and we're just not quite sure what that's gonna to do to customer demand. We have added a volumetric charge on top of that fixed rate. So there is some kind of monthly financial feedback um, to that customer. What, what would you do if you found some leak that was undetected that was certain enough? Same thing that you do now, um, kind of do do an evaluation and kind of settling up. I mean, there's a lot of bill adjustments. You would just have to go back. In addition to adjusting the bill, you'd have to adjust the consumption, um, which most utilities don't do. They adjust the bill, but if you're looking at consumption trends, um, the leaks are not usually taken. So the incentive here is for people to actually kind of <coughs> levelize their water use, which aligns very nicely with the um, water utilities cost structure. So that kind of behavior change actually can drive down utility costs um, instead of you know, the kind of monthly peaking that goes back and forth. Customer select um, is the second model that we are modeling. Um, the easiest way to explain this is phone plan. So you have a not to exceed limit, you lock into a fixed monthly charge um, based on an allotment of water use. And if you go above that, 
you have a pretty punitive um, variable rate that's applied to consumption, but as long as you stay below that level, um, you have a fixed rate um, across the board. So you could have three plans for working, you know, do you have lots of plans, do you have few plans, um, how does that impact it? One question here is how do you know what plan people are going to choose? Um, you know, are people going to go with their average water use and kind of deal with those extra overage charges um, in the summer months? Or are they just going to want to fix it and forget it? Are they just going to want to choose a plan that locks them in? They're never going to go above. They'll know what their rate structure is from month to month. This one has a lot of benefits as far as customer understanding, because um, I think people can generally kind of understand this concept. <laughs> this may be a stupid question, but I'm thinking of my cell phone plan. If I didn't, would my unused water consumption roll over to the next month? We've talked, yeah, no, it's not a dumb question. We've talked about that. It doesn't, so one thing that doesn't quite fit with comparing water use to cell phone use is that your cell phone use probably doesn't change, your cell phone habits are pretty consistent throughout the year. Water use is not the same. So if you start to talk about rollover gallons, you lose that, um, the way to make the peaking behavior, you, you lose that mechanism. Um, so we have not modeled it with roll. So both of these models, um, from a budget perspective, you kind of know going into your budget year, it's fixed, fixed revenue. The punitive charges, you could model that to be, um, you know, icing on the cake or use that revenue, you know, to fund a conservation program to get people um, below certain levels. So from a, from a budgeting perspective, the water-wise dividend model is also kind of a nice um, model in thinking about it on the front end. It's actually a finance model and not so much of a rate model, so it would overlay any kind of rate structure that a water utility have. have. And basically what the utility would do is set financial metrics that they want to meet. Um, that's really important in our modeling is to make sure that those financial metrics are met. And then beyond that, turning that revenue, turning that profit o back over to the customers that used less water. Um, so we kind of have this showing here that the, the dollar bills are coming back to the households that cut their, their water use. One of the things that I really like about this model is that it communicates that idea that the utility is not running for a profit. Um, that people are shareholders in their utilities and they are kind of sharing in that um, financial success and financial gain. It basically means, in modeling this, is that you kind of overshoot your projections a little bit so that you can um, cut that check. We haven't had as many people get excited about this model. I think the, the finance officer um, for DC Water was like, I'm not giving any of our money back. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Um, and I think credit rating agencies are also, when we've talked to Fitch ratings about this model, are a little bit uncomfortable with giving some of the revenue back. But again, we're still kind of playing with some of these models. I think it holds um, a lot of merit to making sure that the utility gets um, the revenue that we need. Can I ask one question yeah, sure. on, uh, on that? Uh, have, have you looked or explored potentially a dividend that's based on consistent water use? In other words, if, if, if the behavior you really want to uh, want to encourage is to have less of that variation from, from month to month to peak month to low month of the year. So if you looked at any models that would give a dividend based on you know the difference between the peak and the bottom of the customer's usage? That is a great idea. We actually have had no utility. We're working on you know our sixth or seventh utility modeling these. Um, and none of them have said we want to model the water wise dividend model. So we haven't gone into various scenarios of how you calculate that rebate beyond kind of some pretty basic assumptions. But I think that would be a great, you can target kind of whatever behavior you would want. And that would be a really good one to target over the kind of using less than you did the previous year. So we are looking 
at um, Customer Select right now doing just some modeling for um, Charlotte, Fayetteville, and um, Owasa all liked the Customer Select model. Um, again, I don't want to give any kind of uh, idea that they're moving forward with these, but you know, we're just playing around with numbers and um, just kind of doing thought experiments with data to see just what it looks like. Who are the winners and who are the losers financially? In these models, I mean, what would you project as the percentage of an individual charge would be in base versus volumetric? So when you say plan A, uh -huh. they're saying they're selecting a rate where we really want them to have a base charge only, a fixed charge. Yes. Yeah. Or you can do, I mean, you can also just assume that they're going to go over. So we have we have lots of different scenarios in looking at it. It's what, what you think customers are going to do. So do you think they're going to choose it based on their average? Because that there are some economically beneficial scenarios where they would choose their average and pay that overage just um, during a couple of months. Or are they going to choose it based on their peak month of demand or their second highest month of demand? So you have to play around with those kind of assumptions a little bit. We don't assume that 100% of the revenue needs are going to be met with those base charges. We still assume there's some variable revenue. What, what we're doing is taking um, fiscal year 2012 um, consumption and modeling these rate structures in a revenue neutral way. So we're looking at what the revenue projections would have been at the beginning of the fiscal year and saying let's set these rate structures to be, to achieve the revenue that you would have hoped to achieve at the top of fiscal year 2012, and then in evaluating their impact to utility revenues, we're comparing what fiscal year 2012 revenue actually was, and looking at the fixed and variable, and comparing that then to what the revenue would be under these different models, comparing the fixed and variable. I think it would be incumbent upon the utility at this point to provide a lot of education. We're gonna have a lot of folks at the bottom end that are not gonna be capable of choosing the right thing for themselves. Yeah, I see that being a huge Communication with all of these models is, is critical for them to work. Um, I would argue that water utilities on the whole have to kind of stop being a silent service now with the infrastructure needs um, that are required for this country. Um, water utilities are just going to have to start talking about their service um, more. My utility director that I used to work for said, I don't want people to think about utilities. Because if they think about utilities, it's when they go to turn on the water and it stinks, or they turn on the light switch and it doesn't turn on. And that's really old school thinking. Um, the utilities that are having success with the rate increases that they need are the ones that are kind of have massive communication campaigns and are really getting in front of that um, message and talking, you know, marketing themselves. So I think that's the communication piece is important. And we're just we're playing with numbers right now. We're still we want to um, we want to take some of these models to the street once we have something to really talk to customers about and talk to them about what do you understand about this? What is confusing? Um, knowing what kind of plans they would choose <coughs> and what they would need from the utility to choose the right plan in this case. In this case, they don't have to choose a plan. It also requires a billing system that can do individualized rates, because each one of these are calculated at the individual household level. <coughs> Any other thoughts on those? We're, I, I would love to hear what you guys, um, you know, holes that you want to shoot in them, or um, anything that makes you excited about seeing any of these models. Since you're asking for holes, I'll go ahead and volunteer what I was thinking. Uh, since you're comparing it to telephone companies and telephone and cell phone plans, the thing that uh, a lot of these companies are moving away from plans like this uh, to show in limited plans, and if you think about it, the thing that upsets customers more, so I would caution against it, would be a cell phone plan that you have all these overage charges on, which is what you're proposing in that for, for water, for potential water. So uh, 
they're going to guess wrong, they're going to have this astronomical rate for the overages, or they're going to have things that aren't the customer's fault, like a leak in their service line, a leak, you know, a mode that's failed or whatever, that's leaking by water, that's going to be occasional, and then all of a sudden they're going to have these high rates. I think the complaint rate will go up, but potentially that will be a downside to that model. So, and, and cell phone companies are actually getting away from those types of also, since your question was about, I, I agree with you. That that's something that needs to be thought about and, um, and considered. And it's an immediate, I think the way that Carrie, in talking to them about these models, the way that they interpreted it was, it's an, it's a, it becomes a matter, of, it's an emergency. When somebody gets that really large bill, it's, it's an immediate thing that must be met, you know, immediate issue that must be addressed. As opposed to peaks at base where it's kind of delayed, um, reaction. That's one of the reasons why they chose to look deeper at the peak set base model, is that they felt like that the customer um, service aspect of that was going to be challenging. And that was even with we talked to them about the use of their they have AMI technology, and they can they can communicate with their customers um, four times a day about their water use, um, and so they actually have that capacity to say whoa, you're getting really close. You may want to you know, slow down your water use. You're getting really close to your allotment. Um, and they didn't see that as a you know, kind of marrying well with this customer select model. Okay. One of the questions I had is that the green model struck me as treating the cost of the utility for 1,000 gallons of water the same, whether it was produced at 1 p.m. or 1 a.m. And of course, it's, it's not the same less during non-peak moments. Is there any consideration of modeling for variable charges that reflect the cost of the utility to produce it? Right. And so what does that look like? What is that coincident peak? I mean, that would be kind of a coincidence, sending some sort of signal um, at the coincident peak. Or it could be the energy answer to that is time of use rates. So um, there are plenty of utilities that have seasonal kind of time of use rate, so the variable charge is higher in the summer and lower um, in the winter. We also see that um, there are quite a few utilities in Texas that use um, the water consumption in the winter months to set the wastewater charge for all subsequent months. So Charlotte has the sewer cap and kind of that same um, sort of idea. We haven't looked, we haven't gotten um, into the detailing of coincident peak Versus, but that that is a great idea. I think these models get a little bit more towards the matching the utility cost structure um, in targeting just peaky behavior in general, um, more so than the uniform rate structure that's applied now um, for the increasing block rate structure. The other alternative, I mean, tapping on the other time too, in addition to uh, considering time and peak, if you've got meters. For that, 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 if you got that infrastructure, uh, would be from a water conservation end. If you wanted to make it less expensive to do, you know, things like irrigation at those lower evaporation uh, hours. Yeah. We actually like that you bring up irrigation. We've looked a little bit at interruptible irrigation rates. So, for those customers that have separate irrigation meters, charging them a lower variable charge when you have plenty of capacity at the plant, but that when you really need that capacity, you can shut them off. Because it's not going inside, it's not gonna, you know, there's not an impact on public health. Um, so they would benefit from a lower variable charge knowing that they could be cut off at any point. And that's, I, I'm still very intrigued about that idea. I would love to, to look more into that. I have to leave you guys with some resources and um, tell you about some of the things that at the Environmental Finance Center that you can use um, as you're thinking about water, setting water and wastewater rates. One is our annually updated water and wastewater rates dashboard. Is there anybody that's not familiar with the rates dashboard? Oh, good. Um, the update will be coming out in January of next year, so next month. Um, it will be water and wastewater rates as normal, and then we also did a tap and impact fee survey this year. 
Um, so be on the lookout. Hopefully that's good timing for your um, budget needs. Um, and then we also have the report that goes along with it. Um, our dashboard, here's a look at it and a way to use it that you may not have thought about in considering this base versus variable revenue is that one of the things that I like to do is to take the dashboard down to the zero consumption point and that allows you to compare base charges. Um, our dashboard has a little bit of a different look as of yesterday because we're using HTML5, so you can use it on your iPhone now. You couldn't do that before, it was flash based. Um, but it should look mostly the same. We also have a tool that's an assessment of fixed versus variable charges and revenues for North Carolina utilities. So it has all of North Carolina utility rate structures built in there, and you can benchmark at every consumption point how your base versus variable revenues compare across the state. Um, and then a little bit more in-depth tool is this revenue risk assessment tool. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but it allows you to compare <coughs> two different rate structures and the revenue vulnerability associated with those two rate structures. You have to put in quite a bit of data about um, consumption levels across different, or the number of customers across different consumption points but it does some pretty good modeling and, and the foundation of that tool is North Carolina utilities. Um, so a lot of the weather assumptions are there. And then there's a report where we apply that tool. So. <laughs> All right, in the interest of time, I could go on for days on this topic and I think some of you probably did too, but I think we'll be around a few minutes afterwards. I will. If anyone wants to ask questions, but please join me and thank you very much.